up to the lab and the ICD update. So when you make an update of a pixel, okay, then you have to complete the update. And so you you change the value of the pixel. But now you all now remember the error sinogram is defined as the difference between the data and the forward projection of the image. So the image is changed, the error sinogram is changed, right? So what you have to do is you take just the change in the pixel and you forward project that and update the error. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Let me get a piece of paper and do this on the document camera, maybe. So the idea is this. Um, so I should try to follow the notation of what well, the lab or the notes. I'm not exactly sure. Should I follow the notes? I'm not sure they're the same. Uh, maybe I should follow the lab notation. Hold on, so you see here. I have to find my web page. Okay, so we go to course. Oh no, we go to course laboratory, and then we go to this right? laboratory computer and open. Okay, so. This is the update procedure, right? Um, okay. Uh, for each. Um, Okay, so this is a special case. This is this is the case you're doing now. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I guess it's similar. It's basically, the same. So you have to update it. Yeah. I forgot. Okay. So what I said didn't make any sense to you because you're not quite here. You're blurring. Have to do an update. Okay. Oh yeah. It's just that okay. So so yeah. So this this is the minimum, right, of the cost function with respect to x. So then yeah. Um, so this is saying xi, the new xi is the old xi. It gets, the, the xi gets replaced by this new updated value, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, right. So, and the cost associated with that is, um, is, uh, is one. Is, is, um, I rewrite this to make it a little clearer, but um, I guess it's just right under the bottom, <laughs> right yeah. here, right? And uh, where now the, there's a lambda in here, and the lambda has to be oh here this lambda this this is this ratio has to be inserted in there. So yeah, do you have any other do you have any questions about that? Yeah. So the question I have is like, say that the first uh, value in your iteration that you decide to update is pixel zero. Okay. So then pixel one is say, and then you go to the next one and you want pixel one and a neighbor, neighbor to pixel one is pixel zero. Right. Right? So then if you update, if you update um, zero mm -hmm. and uh, then calculate pixel one, that's going to have a different value than if you don't. Absolutely. Right? But then if order matters, yeah. Right, like it seems like raster order is still like arbitrary. You could pick like say you decide to update pixel like hundred, and then you update some other one that's pixel you know not a neighbor. Yes. Yeah. So you're gonna get different values in the order. Right. Kind of. That's an excellent question. Okay. So let me switch over to the document camera. So what you're saying is the order in which you make these updates matters, right? Yes. So uh, let's say this is the image. Your image is four by four. It's pretty fine. Okay. And now, um, so if you do this one, this if you do an order, it's graph order. It'll be different than if you did this one, and this one, and this one, and this one. Okay. So, um, 
That's absolutely true because well, if you do this one and then you do this, if you do ones that don't touch first, right? Then as long as they don't touch, then the order doesn't matter. But if they do touch, then the order does matter because the previous one will affect the next one, right? And in fact, later we're going to talk about solving the problem where it's y minus ax squared plus x transpose of ax. So in that case, if a is uh, in a lot of cases where A is you know, sufficiently, okay, if the two pixels, okay, so each pixel corresponds to a column of the matrix A, right? And if the two columns, if the inner product of the two columns of the matrix A is non-zero, then, then order will matter in that case too. Because that means one pixel can affect the other one. In tomography, what happens is that you you have like um, you have measurements of projection. So a projection might be like like this. So you measure the sum, say, of those pixels. So what you know is that that sum has to equal something, or has to approximately equal something. So if I just this pixel, then that pixel will care because if I make that pixel, so let's say I know that the sum is is equal to some value, and the, the current sum of the pixels is less than that. So the measured sum is more than, than the actual current estimate of the sum, right? Then, then one of these pixels is probably wrong, needs to be raised, okay? So if I update this pixel, and I'll try to raise it up enough to compensate, to adjust it so that it matches the projection. But that means that this pixel doesn't need to be raised as much. So if I did it in a different order, the values might come out different, right? They definitely would come out different, okay? Because the forward projection of these pixels uh, has an inner product which is non-zero. Uh, the forward. So when I look at this row, I'm actually okay. So to, to get some intuition into this, you have the matrix A, right? A column of the matrix A represents the, the forward projection of a single pixel. A row of the matrix A is, represents all the pixels which affect a particular measurement. In fact, maybe I should have actually drawn it with the arrow on the other side. You say, well, what difference does it make? Because the output is on, on the left, right? So when I think about it, if I multiply by a, a, a vector x, the output is going to be um, is the measurement, right? And at one position, that's all. That that that's one measurement. So one row of this matrix corresponds to the weightings associated with all the pixels that contribute to that one measurement. Let me say that again because I noticed that the nod got smaller there. Okay. Okay, because this is actually an important concept. This is the matrix A, right? And then you multiply it by a vector say x. We'll pretend everything's square. It doesn't have to be. And the output is y, right? So one column in the matrix corresponds to one pixel of the input. So that pixel will, uh, will affect the output measurement. The, uh, the forward, that row. I'm sorry, that column of the matrix corresponds to all the output measurements that are affected by this pixel. Right. So more than one output measurement could be affected. So uh, in, in, I think the tomography case is, is, is perhaps the easiest to understand. So maybe you had multiple projections. So maybe one projection you had is you have a projection like this, right? And then another projection you have with a projection like that, right? Okay? So what would happen is that, uh, and then, you know, you have smaller projections like this, say. I'm just making it up because I want to make it simple. Okay? 
So, so this pixel contributes to two measurements. It con contributes to that measurement and it contributes to that mood. Okay? So, uh, one pixel contributes to two measurements. So, if you think about this column of this matrix, if that's the S this pixel, that the column of this matrix will have two non-zero values in it, corresponding to the two weighting associated with the two projections. Does that make sense? Was that not like a... Yeah, it makes point? sense, but I guess I still don't... It seems like the whole point of this is like you avoid like the arbitrariness of picking yeah. order. I'm getting there, but keep reminding me because I haven't answered your question yet. Okay. Okay, right now I'm taking a diversion, okay? For the purposes of kind of explaining something that I think relates to your question is important. Maybe I'm wrong, okay? But okay, so 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 each co so a column in the matrix, okay? Okay, so a column in the matrix corresponds to the forward projection of the pixel. And a row of the matrix corresponds to all of the uh, the measurements that can, all the pixels that contribute to a single measurement. Now, if two columns of the matrix have an inner product which is not zero, then your concern will hold that that two pixels can each account for a change in that measurement. So it'd be like two pixels along this projection. Either one of them can be adjusted. But you're, it's like you're solving a crossword puzzle, right? We have multiple constraints. So they say, you know, like a, um, I don't know, like a, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, a preposition with the with the letter O in it, okay? And you say, well, it might be of or to, okay? <laughs> okay. Either one fits into the crossword puzzle, but the problem is, is that you've got to match multiple constraints, right? So this, the number of equations you have is the number of rows in the matrix, and then and the number of variables you have is the number of columns, right? So you want to have at least as many equations as you have unknowns, generally speaking. Oddly enough, you can solve these problems when you have fewer equations than unknowns. Because we're going to also add this, this regularization, this prior model. Now, so now, but all this is very disturbing to you because you're saying he's avoiding my question, which might mean usually when people avoid my questions, it means that they, they, I'm not going to like the answer. Okay. Okay. He's avoided the question, which is, well, if it depends on what order I do this sort of thing in, then what's the point? You know, like, uh, it's completely arbitrary. Ah, but if I do this optimization, okay, uh, and actually I think I wrote some of this in the notes, but maybe I'm not, uh, we go into a lot more deep, I have a lot more in the notes in it later, okay, but the, if we do the minimum over x, um, that, uh, generally speaking, is unique, okay, uh, I get some conditions later, if, if b is positive definite, then this is unique because it's a strictly convex function. And if I say have the additional constraint that x has to be positive, then this is a, a convex set, and this is a strictly convex function, so it has a, a unique global minimum. Okay? Actually, uh, you need a little bit more than that, I think, because it could be that if you had a convex function on a convex set, it could be that the minimum was at infinity. Okay? But if the minimum, if, if there exists a local minimum, uh, that, uh, and, and then you have a, a strictly convex function on a convex set, then the local minimum is a, is a, is a global minimum, okay? And it's uniquely the solution of the KKT condition. So uh, forget the positivity constraint, because then things get a little bit easier. And it says that the, the cost function, this is, a necessary and sufficient condition uh, for the solution to the global minimum if it's a strictly convex function, which it will be if B is positive definite. Okay? And B is supposed to be positive definite. It turns out B isn't positive definite. I'm lying to you very slightly, okay? Because of this thing that I said that the prediction filters sum the one coefficient, 
So that's like we're cheating a little bit because it's really not a probability distribution because one of the eigenvalues is zero. So the integral is the infinite, okay? But, you know, that what's infinity among friends, right? So there's this little diddly thing associated with one coordinate, and you can let some epsilon go to zero and it's fine, okay? So just let's pretend that this is a positive definite function, okay? Then, then this is a global, a comp, strictly convex, and even, and by the way, it, it, even if this isn't positive definite, as long as that thing is full rank, then you're okay, okay? You're pretty much covered a variety of different ways. So basically, this is always going to be a strictly uh, convex function, okay? So, um, or, uh, so it's a positive, it's a strictly convex function, and uh, this is a necessary condition, sufficient condition for chronic evolution. And um, so, the solution is unique. Furthermore, um, if you're not at the, at the solution, we'll call this x hat, if you're not at the solution, then the gradient isn't zero. Because it's not just, uh, it's not just a, a necessary condition, it's sufficient. If it's zero, it has to be the solution. Okay, so any place that it's not zero, it's any place it's not the solution, it can't be zero. By the way, that was pure logic, okay? You have to get used to, I do this very easily in my head because I, I do it for a living, this sort of logical negation of complicated Boolean operators, okay? But you get used to that a while. So if I told you, okay, um, if, uh, if I tell you that the derivative has to be zero at, um, uh, at, at, um, if I tell you that the derivative of zero is zero if and only if you're at the global minimum, right? Then if you're not at the global minimum, the, the, the derivative can't be zero, okay? So, uh, okay, so if the derivative is zero, okay, uh, then, then that means, uh, so that means if you're not at the solution, then the gradient C of x is not zero, if um, x is not equal to x hat, right? Okay. Well, if that's true, that means the derivative with respect to one of the coordinates has to be non-zero, right? Because if this is not true, that means that there exists an i uh, such that uh, the gradient of c of x with respect to x i is not zero, right? Because if it were zero for every i, then the gradient would be zero. But if the gradient is not zero, that means that the, uh, by updating that pixel, you can reduce the cost. Because if I have a 1d function, so all I know is that the gradient is not zero here, okay, of a 1d function. Well, I can only find an epsilon ball, okay, I can always find an epsilon ball, so, so I guess this would be 2 epsilon. I can always find an epsilon ball such that within that epsilon ball, if the function is continuous, and it's got to be a continuous function, well, it's a quadratic function, but by the way, any convex function has to be continuous. Why? Because if I have a discontinuous function, right, and then it goes, right, then if I take this, if I take two points on it, then uh, this is not an upper bound of the function. So you basically can prove that if a function is convex, it has to be continuous. So if you have a continuous function with a derivative that's uh, not zero on an epsilon ball, it's got to go below that value. Right? If you move a really small distance, it's got to get smaller in the direction of the negative gradient. So that means that the ICD update is going to change. So my point is this, you can basically prove, I'm actually, okay, so now I'm going to do a little sleight of hand. What I've actually just proved is I've proved that, that the only fixed point of the ICD update is the global minimum cost function. But you can also prove, and, and we, we can also, okay, it's also easy to prove that every update causes the cost function to go down. But one might conclude from that that the asymptotic limit of the ICD cut updates 
Let's say that this is xn, those are the IGC updates. Does that just be equal to x hat? Sadly, that conclusion is not immediate, okay? Because you could have weird situations where you sort of off, where you like, ask, the cost function asymptotically goes down, but it doesn't convert to the global minimum. Except for you can prove that that can't happen. So there are various proofs of that. You can actually come up with weird ICD updating algorithms that clearly have a deep flaw in them. If you really wanted me to, I can come up with an example where it won't convert. But for the ones you're doing here, they always converge, okay? So, so what does that all mean? That was a very long-winded way, I guess, of saying that when you solve this problem, uh, when you solve the problem of the ICD update, uh, I have a, uh, hold on. I thought I, I started, okay, well, I'll do it again. Okay, so when you do the update, where do I have the equation? Okay, well, anyway, when you minimize uh, that, then when you do this update of these pixels, yeah, the specific result you get will depend on the order in which you update the pixels. But if you do enough of these updates, eventually you'll convert to the same solution independently of the order. So the only thing that really matters is what's the rate of convergence. So the, what you actually do, now there's a couple ways to measure the rate of convergence. One way is that you could actually plot the cost as a function of the uh, iteration number. So we'll call this 10, okay? So, uh, and uh, this might be, over here is C infinity, okay? So what will happen is, so it'll go like this, now if it, so it'll go like this, right? Now what happens if it goes, goes like that, what do you know? Yeah, you got a box, okay? Okay. Don't go like this, right? Okay. So that's fine, and that's actually what typically you guys will do. You'll just check to see that that cost function will go down. The problem is, what are the units of cost? I mean, what do you want to see? What will happen? Someone will come in and they'll say, you know what? Um, the cost function in this iteration only changed by 10 to the minus 32, okay? Times. 3.8, okay? And you'll say, well, so I must be converged. I have no idea whether that's converged or not, okay? Because is that a small number or is that a big number? If it was 10 to the minus 38, 32 Google light years, okay, then this would be a big distance, okay? If it's 10 to the minus 32 Armstrong, and it's really small. It doesn't have any units here, so it's very hard for me to say in any kind of meaningful way whether the cost, whether I converge or not based on the cost. So what you typically do is instead you take x hat, the actual, uh, actually this is a, don't worry about doing this for the lab, okay? This is just for your own uh, educational benefit, okay? You take the difference between you know it's the correct, you run this algorithm for a long time until it converges. And then you take the difference and you take, say, the norm squared and you plot that. And then that, and then you can actually take that and divide it by, say, x squared. And you can even take the square root of the whole thing. Okay? And this is sometimes called uh, percent RMS error. Okay, or, 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 or yeah, uh, or normalized sometimes, normalized RMS the error, right? And this has the unit of, of uh, basically fractional units, okay? So you could make, you could even multiply it by 100, and then it's in units of percent, right? And then you could actually see this will be 100 percent, and this you can say, oh, I'm within five percent of the correct answer, so then it's pretty good. But what will happen is that if you do the raster order update, the convergence might is going to be like one speed, okay? If you do the, if you, it turns out, if you do the update in other orders, it might be faster or slower, right? Because if you're observing, it's different. It turns out that if you do randomized order, usually it's faster. I don't know if you guys have observed that. Uh, but, uh, or you can do some other kind of ordering. 
You, but the trick is you need to hit all the pixels before you repeat. That was kind of a long answer to your question, but maybe you learned something. Yeah. How do we know it's hacked? Yeah. Well, that's a very good question. So what you can do uh, in practice, because you don't usually have an oracle to tell it to you, right? So what you do is you actually run the algorithm for a really long time, and based upon, and then you say, well, how do you know what a really long time is? Is 10 to the minus 32 a really long time? Or is 10 to the plus 32 a really long time? I don't know. So, you run, you, yeah, this is kind of based on experience. You know that when the image stops changing a lot, uh, and, and then you, you run it until the image stops changing a lot, and then you run it a lot more, and then you try some different algorithms. And you come and ask me because I've had a lot of experience. And this is where the kind of subjective judgment comes in. You run this until it converges, and then you use that. Okay. But the um, uh, yeah, and 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 just while I'm like saying this, I say a lot of odd things in this class. So I actually think some fraction of them are useful. Um, one thing that's kind of interesting that you really need to understand for people with a simple processing background, okay, is that um, like. Uh, if I measure the distance between two things, right, okay. or I measure something, right, and I say, well, how far is this apart, and you say one, okay, that effectively has no meaning at all, right, because I can always say anything is one. You say, how long will it take me to get to school this morning? One, okay. How far away is Alpha Centauri? One, okay. Like, you know, um, how many administrators have taken through a light bulb? <laughs> One. Well, that's not true. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but, okay. Okay, here you actually have a unit. It's the unit of an administrator, okay? It's actually an administrator's unit, but I'll tell you about that later sometime. But the, um, so one doesn't have any meaning in that case, okay? Because, um, <laughs> because, because it doesn't have any unit, okay? I mean, you're going to think I'm just talking to myself here, okay? But this is really very, very, very important, okay? This idea of unit. If one doesn't, it, it, this might be one light year, okay? This might be one nanometer, okay? This might be one second, okay? It might be one uh, fortnight, okay? Okay, it might be one, I don't know, cubic centimeter per uh, newton uh, watt, okay? One doesn't mean anything, okay? Now, I know that the problem is signal processing people have this unitless disease, okay? Because they're like, well, it was one, okay? <laughs> because my other answer was 256, okay? So, um, you've got to think in terms of units, because if you're trying to determine whether something is large or small, the concept of large or small always is relative to something else, okay? So, you can't talk about whether one is big or small unless it's got units and you're comparing it to something. So keep that in mind. It's very important. Um, uh, okay. Uh, any other questions? Uh, so, uh, I know, are you guys struggling with the lab? I know some people have successfully implemented it. Other people are, are having some, are still experiencing some and technical difficulties. So how many people have successfully implemented the lab, like the first part of the lab, where you just, okay, and the cost function went monotonically down? Good, excellent. If you're having problems and you're thrashing on this, um, let me know, okay? Especially out in TV land. Um, uh, I'll try to, uh, I don't want you to thrash too long on this. Um, because I, I think some thrashing is good. Uh, you need to do that. You just have to work through it. But but I don't want you to get like too horribly frustrated. Okay. Um, so uh, 
Okay, so now, um, uh, uh, now um, we first talked about non-convex cost functions. So if we have basically a form of like y minus ax norm squared, right, uh, plus um, like a sum over pixel pairs, we'll say fr, of um, some function rho of xs minus xr, right? And um, and this is some sort of cost function, right? Okay. Now, uh, so um, so then the question is, uh, when is c of x convex? So, well, um, uh, like finding necessary and sufficient conditions for convexity uh, could be challenging in general. But uh, if you want to just, usually what happens is people have um, uh, sufficient conditions for convexity. So there's some conditions under which you can be sure it is convex. Convexity is a relatively strong condition, so a lot of functions aren't convex. But uh, so, uh, but you know, if you can come up with um, uh, conditions which ensure convexity, well then, oh, that's good. Okay. Now, one thing is that if you have two functions, f of x and plus f of, of say g of x, and if this is convex, and if they're both convex, then the sum is convex. So if you add two convex functions, they're convex. Okay. Um, the other thing is if you um, if you have a function, uh, so if you have a convex function of um, of a, sorry, a subspace. So if this is con if f is convex, right, uh, then g of x is going to be convex. So the intuition there is that if you have a, let's say you have a function which is convex, so that's a convex function, right? And if you take that function and you do this, so you have, uh, okay, so you have like. Uh, So you have um, you apply that function as sort of a cone, what I call a generalized cone in three dimensions. So in a higher dimensional space. So what you're doing, you're saying, I don't know if I've just drew that very well, but it's as if you took a piece of paper and you curved it. I don't know if you're going to be able to see this. If you curve it. Uh, so you take the piece of curved paper and you curve it. Uh, so the piece of paper is rigid. Well, okay, it's flexible, but it doesn't stretch, right? So if it was like a thin membrane, like a piece of rubber, you could stretch it over something, okay? But it's, you can't do a compound curve with a piece of paper, right? So it only bends along one axis. So it's like, so as long as it's a convex function along that one axis, then the two-dimensional function is also convex. So that's the intuition between behind saying that that if f is a convex function, then f of ax is going to be a convex function where a is a linear operator. Okay. So um, uh, so the sum of convex functions is convex, and a convex function evaluated on the projection of an uh, of a of, of x is, is a convex function. So how do you use these things to show that this general thing is convex? You have the norm of y minus ax squared plus a sum over all pixel pairs of this function rho of x of s minus x of r. Well, now, if rho is not convex, this is pretty hopeless. It's not going to be a convex function. Okay. It's hard to prove it. I mean, I'm sure you can come up with some crazy counterexamples, but in practice, if rho is not a convex function, this is probably not going to be a convex function. Okay. But if rho is a convex function, then this has to be a convex function. Why? Well, first of all, this function rho, okay, the rho of the difference between the two pixels, that's a convex function in the in the full dimensional space of Xn, right? Because um, let's do a quick proof of that. Because um, you can have a matrix. Uh, uh, oh, I'll call it P. So P then is um, 
it's going to be uh, it's going to be a one in the position uh, f, and it's going to be a minus one in the position r, and everything else is going to be zero. Okay, and, and then then um, you can define the function f of x is equal to rho of p of x, right? So this is a projection of x, or not a projection, but it's a it's a transformation of x, right? And that's going to be equal to rho of x s minus x r. So this is this is if so rho is convex, then f of x must be convex. Does, does that make sense? Then, in addition, you're summing all these. But now you're summing convex functions of x. So the sum of convex functions of x is a convex function. And now, this is also a convex function. I mean, there's various ways to tr prove it. But um, uh, it's one way of proving it is that, well, you, you can just show that any quadratic, well, first of all, um, the function, um, so uh, f of x equals a constant a. Is that a convex function? It's sort of a, is. So it's, there's two possible answers to this question. <laughs> yes, no, or I don't know, or maybe, or. Let me change the subject. <laughs> Which is it? It's not strictly convex. No, no, it's yeah. not strictly no. convex. But you think it's is it generally convex? Huh? I guess this is even if it's not strictly convex, yeah. it can still be generally convex. It's convex, yes. It's a little counterintuitive, but it's the function which is constant, right? But if I draw, a, uh, if I connect two points on that line, it's mm -hmm. a, a, a greater than or equal to it, right? It's sort of trivially convex. So the answer is yes. Just say yes. Okay? It's sort of an anti uh uh what's her name? Oh oh gosh, I can't remember her name. The person who started the just say no campaign. Oh, oh hold on. Reagan. Nancy Reagan, thank you. It's the anti Nancy Reagan. Just say yes. Okay, now. Yeah. And then you have f of x, you can have some kind of thing like this. If you have the function, so if it's a scalar function, oh, if you have x transpose b plus a, is that a convex function? The function b. What does that function look like, by the way? Huh? Yeah. It's linear. It's actually a theme, technically speaking. So, unfortunately, I can't draw very well, but it's just like a tilted plane, right? And the axis of tilt of a plane, how would I draw a tilted plane? Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's hard to tell if the plane's tilted or not. But, okay, if I go like this, it must be tilted. Okay. That's a tilted plane, right? And the axis of tilt, so it looks like maybe that's the direction of maximum uh, gradient. The axis of tilt is the, uh, is the direction of, of the, the gradient, okay, which is precisely B, because B is gradient. If I differentiate this with respect to X, I think X transpose B, the gradient of F is going to be B. B is the gradient. Okay. So let, let me just write that out. So if I write, so F of X is X transpose B plus A, and then the gradient of F is going to be just B. Okay. So um, is everybody okay with that? Okay. So um, so this is, is this convex? Yes. So, 
So, okay. So if I have, um, so if I have a, a one minus ax one squared, right? I can write that out as equal to um, uh, it's equal to what? It's equal to x transpose a. Okay, let me write it. I'm, 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 I can do it in my head, but I, I shouldn't because I want to make sure you guys understand. I do. So it's y minus a x transpose times y minus a x. Right. So is it clear that this is equal? These two things are equal. So now if I multiply that out, I get. Uh, so this is going to be y transpose minus x transpose a transpose times y minus ax, right? So this is going to be then equal to y transpose y minus 2 x transpose a transpose ax, right? And then we'll be plus x transpose a transpose ax, right? Right? So, so this whole thing is going to be equal to a minus two. Oh, I messed something up. Okay, you guys have to stop agreeing with me. <laughs> okay, this is supposed to be y. Uh, I actually skipped the step. I should. Okay, I skipped the step. Do you want me? To, uh, okay, I feel bad. I should do this again. Okay, so. Okay, um, so I'm computing the product of, uh, I have y transpose minus x transpose a transpose quantity times y minus a x, right? So that's going to be y transpose y in one term minus well, x transpose a transpose y, right? Then we'll have minus uh, y transpose a x, right? And then we'll have plus x transpose a transpose a x, right? Now these two terms uh, can be added. They look different, but they're but they're both uh, vectors, okay? Uh, oh, no, I'm sorry. These are both scalars, okay? So since the transpose of a scalar is equal to itself, right? So we know that these are equal. So, uh, right. So let me uh, let me just do that for this quick. Group. Okay. So if I have x transpose a transpose y, that's a scalar, right? So let's say it's I don't know some variable alpha. Okay. Now, if I have a scalar alpha equals alpha transpose because the scalar is equal to its transpose, right? Turbulent. So therefore we know that x transpose a transpose y, if we transpose, is got to be equal to, to x transpose a transpose y, right? Because it's a scalar, so of course it's equal to its transpose. Is everybody okay with that? Okay. So if I take the transpose, I get y a x, or y transpose a x. So consequently, you know that y transpose a x is equal to x transpose a transpose y. They're equal because they're scalars. Okay. So I can actually add these two terms, which I just do automatically in my head because I've been doing this for a long time. If you Stick with this sort of thing. You can, you, it's amazingly good how good you can get at it after doing it for a long time. And you can impress all your friends. Um, it makes for great party tricks. So, y transpose y equals, okay, then minus 2, and I can use either of the two because they're equal, but I guess I'll do y transpose ax, right? And then this is plus x transpose a transpose a x, right? So what I can do then is um, basically I can define uh, b, I can define 
say alpha equals y transpose y, and I can say beta equals um, uh, y transpose uh, a, okay? And then I get that the whole thing is equal to alpha plus beta times x plus uh, and uh, well, the third thing is I'll say B is equal to A transpose A, and, and this will be uh, X transpose VX. Right. Now, is that a complex function, alpha, a constant? Yes, because yes, we proved that. Is this a complex function, beta times X? Yes. Yes, because that was. That was this case, remember? X, uh, X times a, uh, any constant is a convex function. Is that just a tilted plane? All right. Is this a convex function? X transpose B X. Y. It's quadratic, but not all quadratic functions are convex. As a matter of fact, um, hold on a minute. Uh, because. Um, Oh, yeah, that's my friend calling me, but I'll, I'll have to call him back later. The, um, not all convex functions are, 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 um, are, um, are convex, right? Because I could have, you know, if it's a scalar, I could have x squared minus, right? And then it'd be like this, and that's concave, okay? And in multiple dimensions, it's not just the choice between those two. Because what I could do is I could do this. I could have a function which is concave like this and convex like that. So to do that, I need a piece of um, like uh, stretchy rubber. Because that would be a saddle point. Which along one axis is convex and along the other axis is concave. Okay. If I had that, I would have like x transpose bx. That that would be what would happen if b was say, if b was equal to a matrix which was plus one, okay, and then minus one and zero zero. So it has one positive eigenvalue and one negative eigenvalue. And on one axis it's increasing, and on the other axis it's decreasing, right? So if all the eigenvalues are positive, this will be a convex function. So if the convex function, when b, is, what are the necessary and sufficient conditions for a quadratic function to be of this form to be convex? Yeah, it has to be actually not positive definite, although it has to be semi-positive definite. Because zero is good enough. And with, what is what is the um, uh, necessary sufficient conditions for it to be strictly convex. Well, that it be positive definite. So then the question is, well, how do I know that B is positive definite or positive semi-definite? Define it that way or it's, well, it's, I, I wouldn't say it's defined that way. I would say it's constructed that way, but you have to tell me how I know that. But I'll give you a clue. The answer is on the page. You're very close, but just articulate it more clearly. Because it's, 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 it's formed by A transpose A. So any anything that's formed by A transpose A has to be a positive semi-definite matrix. How do I know? Well, how do I define positive semi-definite, right? Uh, the definition of positive semi definite is that for all x, a member of R, okay, that uh, R to the n, that x transpose bx is greater than or equal to zero. That's the definition of positive semi definite. But I can prove that because I have, that if it's formed by this form of a transpose a, then I have that x transpose a transpose ax is greater than or equal to zero, right? But that's like AX transpose AX. 
is greater than n equal to zero. Oh, I, I shouldn't say that. This is what I have to prove, okay? So how do I... Uh